Hello, I'm Rita Moreno, and I'm here to tell you that I am devoted to the cause of anything that supports museums. When my daughter was, uh, well, when my daughter could walk, we immediately started bringing her to museums. Just even she couldn't understand necessarily, but she was taking it all in. And when the Museum of uh, Natural History in New York City decided to do a class for very, very young children on African art and objects, Fernanda was one of the first children to be enrolled. And she came home with this. Now, I am 88 years old. <laughs> I had to think about it. And this has been in my heart and in my bedroom, wherever I am, all of my life. Because it reminds me how important art and exposure to knowledge and beauty, so how much of it can be found in museums. So I want to say thank you to the workers of museums worldwide in Puerto Rico, in New York City, in, in Europe, Every museum that exists in my daughter's travels has been visited by her more than once. You are invaluable. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning, and well to the continuation of the first American Alliance of Museums virtual annual meeting and museum expo. I'm Laura Lott, president and CEO of AAM. Thank you to the thousands of museum professionals who joined us two weeks ago for our kickoff and welcome back. And welcome to those of you joining us for the first time today. Thank you to our visionary sponsor, Blackbaud, for their generous support. We have a full program this week that addresses many important issues facing our field. In my opening re remarks of stakes weeks ago, I called on all of us to support each other, be kind to each other, check in on our colleagues and practice empathy during this difficult time. I'm joining you live this morning to share a somber message about recent events that make that call to action even more crucial. Today, I'm not just talking about the global pandemic that has led to more than 365,000 deaths worldwide, shuttered our museums and forced near record unemployment. In recent weeks, the United States suffered multiple racist attacks resulting in the senseless killing of black people and unfathomable violence across our country. These atrocious murders are a jarring reminder that we in the museum field are either living with or have colleagues who live with the possibility of something violent or hateful happening to them on any given day simply because of their race, ethnicity, gender identity or sexual orientation, nationality or religion. A colleague recently commented that these racist acts are a reminder that while we may be less exposed to a virus by staying away from each other, we are increasingly exposed to the anxiety, pain and anger that can come from dealing with traumatizing events alone. In this time of forced isolation, we must be especially vigilant in looking out for each other. So I ask you again to seek each other out, ask caring questions, and listen carefully to what you hear. The museum field not only has a responsibility to ask the hard questions and learn from each other, we have a unique duty to listen, to chronicle the lessons and history of our communities, and to educate future generations so that we might stop this senseless violence. These are difficult times, but they are not insurmountable. While we cannot change and control everything that's going on in our world, we do each have the power to bring light and empathy to our fellow human beings. None of you are alone. You are each part of an alliance of colleagues who are here to listen, and who need to be heard. Thank you again for being online with us this week. Now I'd like to welcome Chevy Humphrey, the Hazel A. Hare President and CEO of the Arizona Science Center and Chair of the AAM Board. Chevy, along with other general session speakers this week, pre-recorded their remarks before the events of the past week. Thank you.
Welcome to AAM's first ever virtual conference. Over 3,000 museum professionals gathered for kickoff day on International Museum Day two weeks ago, and we're looking forward to a great conversations this week. It is likely an understatement to say that the novel coronavirus pandemic has affected every dimension of contemporary life. Amid the upheaval and uncertainty, the projected economic, social, and of course, health and medical implications are staggering. The pandemic has highlighted with a harsh fluorescence the disparities and inequities that have come to define the American economy and social fabric. As museum leaders and advocates who have worked with or on behalf of our communities for the better part of our careers, these days we are thinking a lot about uncertain future that awaits the millions of our visitors and members whose lives have been so chaotically disrupted in the past few months. The abrupt but necessary temporary closures across the country have the thrust this long ignored issue into the national spotlight. We have an even greater responsibility today than we've ever had. This is a reality that we must work together to change. What we do now to support our communities is vitally important. As we try to make sense of what the next normal might be, it's clear that resuming business as usual will be exceptionally difficult and perhaps not even relevant or desirable. Many leaders have characterized the shutdown and eventual restart in terms of a strategic opportunity to learn from the sacrifices we've collectively have made to recalibrate the missions of our organizations and to restate the core values of why we exist in the first place. Organizations that take advantage of this strategic opportunity have a chance of coming back stronger. But the strategic opportunity frame may not go far enough. The pandemic has made it imperative to fundamentally change how we operate, which for many of us will mean that while we maintain our brands, we will become essentially new entities in what we do and can be during and beyond this pandemic. I am proud of AEM's rapid response to our needs during this global pandemic with content, connection to each other, advocacy, and a quick pivot to the virtual conference. As the new chair of AEM, I'm humbled to serve you and here to listen to what your needs are. The AEM board is truly dedicated to our museum field. I would like to thank Kippen de Albachu for his tireless service as board chair, and another big thanks to our outgoing board members for their service. As a leader of an institution, I am hopeful. I am focused on adaptive leadership at warp speed because the only certainty right now is uncertainty. Adaptation requires resiliency. Our industry has learned to embrace a more rapid pattern of failing, falling down, getting back up, trying again. We don't know the shape of the future. So instead, let's do our best to shape it by deliberately planning to be even more adaptable and by strengthening and reaffirming an organizational culture that values visitors and communities first and by continuing to provide resources they need to learn and grow. The macro lesson is that we are indeed all in this together more than ever before. We, we may not be able to predict the next normal, but we can work together to create it. Thank you and enjoy your virtual conference. As an arts and cultural organization, you anchor and connect your surrounding communities, providing the spaces for families to make lasting memories together, generation after generation. And in doing so, you help us understand the universe and our place in it. You also know that cultivating meaningful and lasting relationships with your visitors extends beyond their time spent with you in person, especially in today's new frontier of digital memberships, virtual events, and online exhibits. 
you build these relationships atop a fundamental purpose to educate, enlighten, entertain, and inspire, which is why you need a technology partner who makes it easier for you to manage your behind the scenes operations so you can focus on what matters most, your mission. With BlackBot's cloud solution purpose built for the arts and cultural community, you get the benefit of 30 plus years of dedicated expertise from the world's leading cloud software company powering social good, enabling you to find and engage an audience passionate about your mission Make a lasting impression on your visitors with a seamless experience from ticket purchase to visit, from membership to donor cultivation. Create ongoing revenue streams by turning inspired visitors into members and donors. Build effective, loyal relationships through unmatched analytics that provide a clear view into your patron engagement. Connect your organization, maximizing productivity so you can spend more time building relationships with your audience. Blackbaud Arts and Cultural Solutions. Turn amazing moments into lifelong relationships. Please welcome this year's local host committee chairs. Kelly McKinley, CEO of the Bay Area Discovery Museum, and Jay Shu, Director and CEO of the Asian Art Museum. Hello everyone, my name is Kelly McKinley and I am the CEO of the Bay Area Discovery Museum. We're a children's museum located at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge in Sausalito, California. I am also very proud to serve all of you as a board member of AAM and also, along with Jay Shu, serve as co-chair of the local host committee. Now, I'm more than just a little bit sad that we're not all sitting shoulder to shoulder together in the conference ballroom for this kickoff session. But I am deeply grateful for the way that the AAM team has radically and rapidly reimagined a way for us all to be together. Now more than ever, we need the inspiration and the insights, the courage and the comfort that comes from being in community with one another. What an immense privilege that we can all come together to support one another through the devastating impacts of this pandemic and draw on our collective wisdom and experience to chart the new ways that we will survive and thrive in serving our community's needs and dreams. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge my cherished Bay Area colleagues who served on the local host committee. Thank you for your wisdom, your brilliance, your generosity, your enthusiasm in creating a truly memorable experience for our colleagues and our supporters. And finally, to all of you, in a world turned upside down, thank you very much for making the time and the space to participate in these important conversations over the next four days. Have a wonderful conference and thank you very much. Hello. I'm Jay Xu, director and a CEO of the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, where although the sun is shining, we are all still sheltering in place. I, along with Kelly McKinley, were honored to serve as co-chairs of the San Francisco Local Host Committee, a group who spent months planning to welcome you and the annual meeting and the museum expo to the beautiful Bay Area for the first time in nearly 30 years. For all of us, the past 12 weeks have been some of the most painful in our lives, as we reflect on the gap between where we thought we would be and the very different place we find ourselves today. At the Asian Art Museum, we would have unveiled our expanded and transformed the museum to the world, launching a new era of art, ideas, and experiences. I would have loved to share all that with my colleagues, that's all of you. The type of sharing that the Alliance Annual Meeting nurtures every year, the kind that reaffirms our work, our sense of a community, and our deep affection for each other and what we pour our lives into. Despite the moments of staggering disbelief in our new reality, 
when filled with sadness, uncertainty, and the fear for the long-term impact on our field. We also find ourselves filled with awe for everyone we work with, starting with our own museum family. The resilience, the tenacity, and the unbridled enthusiasm and creativity of museum staffs, boards, and supporters for all kinds are truly inspiring. And inspiration is still what museums do best. Now that we spend all day online, we have all embraced our conference theme and radically reimagined our cherished institutions as virtual museums with digital programming and educational content that continue to fill lives with history, art, science, culture, music, mindfulness, and of course, with the essential stories that the audiences have always come to us for and will need when we reopen. From crisis comes opportunity, opportunity to invent, to innovate, and to impact those most in need. These are the actions that define resilience, and these are the actions that I see all of us taking now, every day, to ensure the survival of our institutions. These are the actions that the American Alliance of Museums and its annual meeting foster and inspire in all of us. To all of you, especially the San Francisco Local Host Committee, I say thank you for the inspirations. Have a great meeting. Hi, this is Brian Stevenson, and I just want to say that the cultural life of any society is critical to the evolution of that community, to the health of that community, um, to an awareness in that community. So I want to thank everyone uh, who is managing this unprecedented time in global history with dedication, with thoughtfulness, with creativity to make sure that our cultural institutions not only thrive but succeed in the important work that has to happen. Uh, we operate the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and we are anxious uh, to recover, to open back up, to make our space the kind of space where people learn and grow. I know you're trying to do the same, and I just wanna thank you for the work that you're doing. Please welcome Christy Coleman. Executive Director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation. To all my museum colleagues, welcome to AAM Virtual 2020 Annual Meeting. I'm honored to share a few thoughts with you as we head into day two of this journey together. When we last gathered May 18th, AAM CEO Laura Lott reminded us that even in this current crisis, we are vital to the human experience. She reminded us of the trust that our communities place in us. She reminded us of the power of our collective work and advocacy. She reminded us to stay true. Following Laura, we had a remarkably inspiring presentation from Dr. Janetta Cole, who never fails to bring it. She inspired us to keep moving forward in power and love for the work that we do. She employed us to boldly move forward to a future where our work continues to reflect the diversity and inclusiveness needed in a just society. And she told us so much more in lifting our spirits and lifting our thoughts. Today, I'm simply going to remind you to breathe. This simple act that we often take for granted provides us fuel. This is fuel for us to think, fuel for us to move, to create, to simply be. And most important, it provides us the fuel we need to reimagine the possibilities. Over the last several weeks, like many of you, I've been involved in phone calls and Zooms and conversations and email chains 
with colleagues all over the country, nay, all over the world, as we've tried to figure out together, tried to find our collective voice of how we are going to respond to this pandemic and what it is doing to our institutions. And during those calls, we've been able to commiserate, we've been able to laugh, We've been able to find those moments of joy. We've been able to spark ideas and reconnect with our vision. All of these things, extremely important as we think about the future of our institutions. It's too easy, it's far too easy to think about everything that could go wrong. It's far too easy to allow ourselves to be wrapped up in the numbers and not that numbers aren't important. But at the end of the day, what becomes most important when we are in the midst of this is to breathe. One second, two second, breathe. This is not a time to fight or flight. It's time to breathe. Because in order to breathe and to have that rejuvenation that's required, it enables us to better serve. And in order to serve, we must be able to hear. We have to hear the voices and see the experience of others around us. And when we breathe, we give ourselves space to look beyond the veil of our own biases. It enables us to find those moments of adaptability. It enables us to find those places of creativity. It enables us to reconnect with what we love in the work that we do. Because you see, at the end of the day, yes, the collections are important, the buildings are important, all of those things. But at the end of the day, why we exist is because our communities need us. Our communities have entrusted each of us to remind the world of why we matter, to remind the world that there is a brighter tomorrow, even when we are in the midst of things and we can't see beyond it. We need to breathe so that we can recapture for ourselves that exceptional space, that exceptional place, that exceptional mindset that enables us to remember why, why. Because once we get the why, it becomes a whole lot easier to figure out, okay, I know why I'm here. I'm here to make sure that my community understands its place. I'm here to make sure that my community has the tools and the resources that it needs to tackle the challenges it currently faces. We are here to provide those moments of clarity and inspiration, whether it's through art or whether it is through music or whether it is through dance or whether it is through looking at the artifact of an ancestor long ago who overcame similar challenges and fears and concerns. We are here so that our communities remember that they are a part of something bigger. And that something bigger enables us to connect, to connect to each other, to connect to our environment, to connect with creatures great and small all around us. We have to remember why when we breathe. And when we get to that why again, now we know what we need to do because we've been listening and we've made sure that the voices and the people that we are gathering to help us are the ones who will tell us not only what they need and what we can do to, to, to achieve that need, but then we'll learn how to do it better. We'll figure out how to get it done. We'll figure out what's really important at the end of the day. We'll figure out that it isn't processes and systems that we're trying to protect and preserve, but instead something far more powerful something far more meaningful, the stories we've spent a lifetime collecting. That is why we breathe. I'm reminded time and time again that we have the opportunity not only to respond in kind, but to respond quickly. 
See, we haven't learned how to do that very well in our business. We like to take our time and slow it down and think through every little piece of the puzzle. And then we have our charts and our Gantt charts and our graphs and all of those things. But that's not what our people need from us right now. They need connection because we're losing it. If history in the past has taught us anything, it is that in times of crisis and all of those struggles that our communities have faced in the past, that sometimes the darker nature comes out, the divisiveness comes out, the fear of scarcity drives behavior that can often be inhuman and unkind. We have the power to remind people that there were always resistance to that urge that there was always a way out because people found that peace. People found those connections and they pushed them and pushed them and pushed them towards common humanity, common care, common love. We have to remember to breathe. We have to remember that all of this is why we exist. We have to remember and reimagine that the ways that we've done it in the past might still work, but we're not living that past anymore. We're moving rapidly towards a very different future, a future that may tell us for the time being, we can't even touch each other. A future that says we may not even be able to pass a plate to each other or an artifact to each other. A future that says, this power of touch, this power of being may not be at our disposal, but guess what? Again, by listening to diverse voices, we may find that there are other ways to connect just as powerfully, that there are other ways that we can see each other, that there are other ways that we can build together. If we breathe, if we breathe, and we're listening and we're remembering that that trust that we have earned, that hard won trust that our communities look to us for certain truths hasn't gone away. We have to remember to seize that as well, to remind people to move into those spaces and say, we were here, we will always be here. It may be different but we can get this done together. That's probably the most encouraging thing that I've heard over the last several weeks from peers is that no one seems like they're ready to give up. There is a hopefulness out there that belies all of the confusion and the deliberate distortion and deliberate disinformation that there are people who are coming together to find solutions. There are people who are not hoarding knowledge, who are not hoarding program, who are not hoarding approach, but who are freely sharing, freely giving, looking for those partnerships that benefit all, that are looking for ways for all of us to ride this storm together. And I believe that is the key. That becomes the key piece to this. The greatest resources that we have in our institutions are the very people that have dedicated their lives to this work. That is our greatest resource. The vision isn't locked in some executive office. The vision can be found in our communities and in our front lines and the behind the scenes. If we just take a moment to breathe and then ask, if we take the moment to look beyond the immediacy, to look at what it could possibly be in just a short order longer. These are the things that I'm encouraging you today to think about in our AAM virtual 2020 conference. That has been the theme of the whole conference, reimagining museums. When that theme was chosen, no one could have anticipated that we'd be going through what we are right now. But I can assure you, we won't, this won't be the last time. As global economies 
and travel and experience continues to expand, we're more than likely to see another pandemic sweep through. The issue will be, what did we learn in this one? What have we learned that enable us to continue that important work that drives our why? That important work that allows us to pivot when we need to, to serve. Because at the end of the day, that is why we are here. We serve communities to remind them, again, to remind them that they are something, they are part of something much larger, much bigger than themselves. They are part of the human family. They are a part of this earth that we share. They are a part, despite their political or social or ethnic or gender or all of the other reasons we come to figure out of how to separate ourselves from one another. We need to find ways to celebrate the diversity that we see in nature in each other. And we can't do that unless we breathe. We can't look at where we have fallen short in the past to imagine a new future if we can't breathe and dare to look forward, even if it means touching on some pretty tough truths about ourselves and what we've done in the past. So the rest of today's sessions are all built around these ideas. It's built around the idea of looking carefully at financial models. We'll be looking at trends in our field. We'll be looking at work that others are doing in the midst of the crisis and what they've learned thus far. You have an opportunity today to get into those sessions and get into those conversations and to create with each other new ways of imagining the future of our field. Why? Because we took a moment to breathe. Why? Because we are called to serve. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll see you online in other sessions over the next several days. Again, thanks, AAM. I'm glad to be a part of this family now for over 25 years as a member. Take care. Please welcome Elizabeth Merritt, AAM's Vice President of Strategic Foresight and Founding Director of the Center for the Future of Museums. Hello. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, let me mention that today's raffle prize uh, comes from our generous keynote general session visionary sponsor, Blackbaud. Thank you, Blackbaud. Two lucky winners will be randomly selected during the presentation to receive a $500 Visa gift card. So everyone logged in now has been entered automatically. If you're randomly selected as a winner, please respond to the prompt that will appear in the chat bot near the end of the near the end of the presentation and you'll be asked to identify yourselves so we can make the official announcement. Good luck and thank you Blackboard. And now to our keynote. 13 years ago I was tasked by the AAM board to start a futurist think tank for the museum field and all that I started with was the name, the Center for the Future of Museums, and the basic concept to help museums adapt to the rapid pace of change in the 21st century. The first thing I set out to do was to discover who else was already doing this work for other sectors. And I quickly gravitated to the Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California, a nonprofit think tank that was founded in 1968 to systematically explore the long-term futures of the US and the world. Since 2006, the Institute for the Future has been directed by Marina Gorbis and under her leadership, their work has been notable for its focus on equity and social justice. Marina excels in her writing, her speaking, and in the project she instigates at the Institute at helping people envision how the world could not only be different, but how the world could be better. Many futurists study technology, but when Marina examines technology, she sees it as a tool 
that can empower individuals to create fairer and more resilient social structures. Her manifesto of universal basic assets is a call to action for organizations throughout society to collaborate, collaboratively identify the key assets people will need today and in the future in order to help lead sustainable livelihoods as individuals and households and as a wider community. That framework inspired me to see how museums can play a vital role in building individual and collective wealth in historically under-resourced communities. It's long been my hope to share her work with you firsthand, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Marina Gorbis as our keynote speaker today. I was still looking forward to being with you in San Francisco this month, but between the time when I agreed to do the talk and today, as we all know, the world seemed to have turned upside down. So naturally I had to rewrite my script many times, just like many of us rewriting the scripts of our lives, our family lives, our organizational lives. And um, it's interesting, I think about historians of pandemics. Charles Rosenberg is one such historian who actually wrote that pandemics are like dramas in four parts, speaking of scripts. Act one is progressive revelation, where we learn more about the disease. Act two is about managing randomness, lots of things that we didn't expect are happening. Act three is about when we figure out the public response. And act four is about moral and ethical judgment. Basically, when we have time to reflect and say, why did this happen? Who is responsible? What do we do that this doesn't happen again? And as we are dealing, I think we're somewhere basically between act one and act two. A lot of things are being revealed, but we're also managing a lot of randomness. Do we open up our spaces? How do we do that? Do we wear masks? Do we not wear masks? Is this virus transmitted on surfaces? A lot of every day you hear something different. So we're managing a lot of things. We're managing a number of different crises. But as we're doing this and managing day to day, and it's absolutely essential for us to do this and to worry about uh, this crisis and taking care of ourselves and our loved ones and our organizations, this is also the time for us to self start thinking about the future. How do we want to come out of this crisis? What is the, our post COVID-19 future? Because the kind of things we're experiencing today is actually the result of decisions and choices we made probably decades ago, maybe even earlier. And similarly, the kind of decisions and choices we make today are probably going to shape our post COVID-19 future. How do we, what do we build after this pandemic? So I want to share with you some ideas and some suggestions for how to think about and how to imagine and really engage in the process of making this post-pandemic future. I want to share with you some uh, basic principles that I think about. So first thing is what we're doing right now is understanding what is happening around us, what is being revealed. One thing that happens in these kind of crises is that a lot of things that were previously hidden or we didn't want to discuss them in polite company or some people knew it maybe in academia but nobody wanted to believe in them you can't ignore them anymore they're really revealed on a large scale so they're kind of staring you in the face so it's important for us to look around and think about what is being revealed and i'm going to ask you uh, to share what is being revealed about the museum sector about the creative sector, about your community, to share your own thoughts. But let me share with you some of the things that I think are important to think about. So one clear thing that's being revealed is that this pandemic is not impacting everybody equally. It's not evenly distributed. This is a map from my own area from Northern California, where we're seeing that these right dots, the big ones, are the communities that were hit most hard by the COVID-19. So they're actually concentrated in four zip area, uh, zip code areas in um, East San Jose. And it happens that those 
three, four areas is where one third of all the cases are, one third of all the deaths are. And obviously these are areas where a lot of low wage people live, a lot of African-American or Latino population lives. So these are areas that are most hard hit by this pandemic. So one way to think about um, this pandemic and thinking about the kind of things that are being revealed is to use this, what I call socio-epidemiological lens. In, from evolutionary biology, we know that parasites and viruses are quite innovative. They're constantly attacking our systems, our own bodies, our larger systems. But if you have a strong immune system, they've evolved to basically withstand those attacks. And in fact, many of these organisms uh, are part of our systems. But when you have a weakened immune system, then these organisms propagate and they undermine your health and they undermine the health of our societies. So if you think about this virus as a kind of a disease vector that's feeding on the social vulnerabilities in our society, that's what's really creating the crisis. That's what's undermining our social systems, our health, our communal health, and all of the society in which we live. So let's talk about these vulnerabilities. Some of them have now become obvious. I'm gonna just bring up three. One is extreme inequality. By now we all know about it. It's being written about, uh, uh, it's being talked about openly, but I wanna make a distinction between when we talk about inequality between income and wealth, because um, a lot of people don't, know about these differences. So income is the amount of money that flows into the household is what you make in a year. It's basically your salaries or your other income that you make. It's kind of like a river. It flows in and it flows out. Wealth, however, is what gives you longer term security. Wealth includes all of your assets. For most people, it's either their homes or it's their financial assets like savings, retirement, uh, you know, all kind of financial, your bank account, all of these things. So assets minus debt is what constitutes your wealth. And the reason wealth is more important in some ways than income is because wealth is what gives you kind of economic security and longer term economic security. It also creates opportunities for you and your children. It determines where you live. It determines where your kids go to school. It determines who is in your community. It determines job opportunities and work opportunities for you. And most importantly, wealth is what's transferred from generation to generation. So if your family was redlined, they couldn't afford, uh, they didn't get a loan to buy a house three generations ago, you're gonna feel it in this generation. It's something that goes from generation to generation. And our wealth inequality in this country is probably twice as great as income inequality. And that's really important. If you can see on this graphic, uh, the bottom, yellow line, this is the bottom 50% of the population that owns less than 1% of the total wealth in this country, less than 1%. And of course, this is also not equally distributed. It's uh, ra racial wealth inequality is huge. It's uh, if you're a black family, average wealth is about $17,000 for a white family, it's about $170,000. So 10 times greater wealth disparity between black and white families. And that's not surprising why we're seeing that zip codes where you have large percentage of black and Hispanic population, where you have people with low wealth levels, low income levels, they're most affected by this pandemic. And that's a big vulnerability in our system because we're also finding out that there is no such thing as private health. You're only as healthy as a homeless person next to you. Um, this virus is highly contagious. So having people who can't afford healthcare, who are not able to have $400 in case of emergencies is going to affect you also. So uh, wealth inequality is one big vulnerability. The other one is the poor health of our 
public health infrastructure. Uh, it's interesting, it's a poor health of our public health infrastructure, meaning that investments in our pu public health infrastructure has been decreasing, not just in this administration, but actually previously. The funding for emergency preparedness has been going down for almost 15 years now. Um, we were just looking at data where uh, the number of public health workers in the last 10 years went down from 250,000 people to under 200,000 people. And obviously, again, we're seeing it geographically where uh, some communities do not have access to health workforce. Those communities that have larger circles have more people available to them. Uh, and the ones that you can see these large territories where there are no circles or very small circles, those are areas where there's lack of availability of public health workers. And of course, on top of it, we also know that large percentage population, uh, particularly mostly low wage workers, um, have very little access to insurance, to public health infrastructure and, and to health insurance. So that creates huge vulnerabilities, uh, health vulnerabilities that's impacting everybody. And finally, another kind of vulnerability is what I call brittle supply chains. It's been kind of amazing and it's a huge revelation that in this time of crisis a country that's so rich that has the largest global enterprises uh, that are so successful that uh, have been touted as best in the world that we actually in this time of crisis people don't have enough sanitizers we don't have enough toilet paper we don't have enough uh, masks, ventilators, you name it. What is going on? How is it possible that in the wealthiest country in the world with these large global enterprises, highly successful, that's on models to the world that we are, ba we are lacking in these basic necessities. And the reason is, and what's being revealed is that yes, these co companies are highly successful. They're very, very efficient, meaning that they have no slack. There is nothing that is available. They're so good, they're so efficient that there's no slack in the system. They're so productive. You know, every time a company cuts employees, reduces employment or cuts their expenses, their stock price goes up, meaning that they have no slack which is great if you're operating uh, in normal times, but in times of emergency where there is a surge, we have basically no slack in the system. So this efficiency goes right against our ability to create resiliency in the system and to be resilient. And part of it is that we've also have this high levels of concentration in different industries. So again, there is no slack. We have very few four top companies own all the drug wholesalers, drug stores, mobile services, cable, airlines, you name it. We have high levels of concentration. Again, very little slack in the system. And not surprisingly, we're seeing it among food companies and cosmetic companies, which explains why we don't have enough sanitizers and why we don't have basic uh, protective equipment and gear that we need. Uh, very efficient, but very bad for resiliency. So those are just some of the vulnerabilities that are being revealed today. But now I want to turn to you. You're probably looking around and seeing some of the vulnerabilities in your systems, in the museum sector in the arts sector, in the creative sector, in your communities. So what I would like you to do is let's take five minutes and why don't you share on chat what you are observing as vulnerabilities. As Again, as I said, in anything, in your sector, in your organization, in your community, anything. So just take five minutes, share those, and we will have a discussion of them after the presentation. So um, now we've talked about the current context and revealing what, what you're seeing around you. The second thing that's important to do is look at patterns, look at history. I always say that uh, as a futurist, I'm as much a historian as a futurist because 
Um, Mark Twain famously said, uh, the history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Meaning that, yeah, we don't repeat the same things, but there are certain patterns that we observe. And particularly when it relates to pandemics, this is not the first time we went through a pandemic. There's been many of them, bubonic plague, uh, cholera, avian flu, you name it. Uh, we seem to be going through this on a, on a regular basis, and there is a pattern to them. What we know is that these are not just health crises, that pandemics are also associated with long-term economic damage, which we're experiencing today, 20% unemployment, possibly will go up. It's disrupting the social fabric, some of our rituals. I don't know how many of you participated in Zoom weddings uh, recently, or how many of you were not able to be at funerals in the way you're used to. So it's disrupting some of the very basic rituals in our, our society. And oftentimes pandemics, large pandemics, lead to polit political upheavals and changes and reinventions. Actually, historians often talk about the bubonic plague and how as a result of the plague, it basically, the, the plague itself spelled the demise of feudalism as a system in Europe for the simple reason that it, so many people, workers died, that there was nobody able to cultivate the fields and do the work that was required on you know, in these fiefdoms. So, and workers gained a lot more power. And as a result of that, we basically ended feudalism. So there are these patterns that we observe in societies. And then as we think about the future, we need to think about not just about the health implications, but long-term social, economic, and political implications. Another crisis that's not a uh, pandemic, but an economic crisis that we often reference during these times is a Great Depression, just because of the numbers of unemployed are similar uh, in the two periods. And it's interesting that that led to another political transformation. We have FDR and the New Deal. We had huge investments in public infrastructure um, and also in the art. Some of the amazing works of art were creating poetry and, and um, music and many different aspects of the arts were the result of investments uh, during that period and believed that artwork is absolutely essential, essential work, uh, and the government should be supporting this kind of work. So it's interesting to think about how these crises create these social transformations and what can we learn about those. Um, the other thing, um, once you've looked at those and taken those steps, the current state, the, the past, uh, I oftentimes, and what we do as futurists, and this is something that you get used to doing all the time, you wake up and you read something or you watch something, you constantly look for these, what we call signals. Um, signals are little things that are kind of happening around us that make you kind of stand up and ask, why is this happening? What is the signal of? It's something that's new. It's a new way of doing things. It's maybe an invention. It's maybe a different user patterns. It may be something that kids are doing. You know, William Gibson, who is a science fiction writer, famously said that future, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So meaning that there are signs and signals of the future all around us. And if you train yourself to look for these signals, they can tell you about possibilities and open up possibilities for the future. So a couple of signals that I think are important uh, that I pay attention to. This is a group of academics and social activists who are uh, looking at something called exit to communities, kind of a movement. So think about startups and uh, when they're ready and they need more money and they're, op they're ready for it, um, they exit to, they do an IPO. They basically sell shares over the counter on, on the stock exchange, right? Um, and so instead of doing that, what about exiting to communities? So imagine these same kind of enterprises and what if the shares they gave were actually given to members of the community? So Im imagine Twitter and it exited not to the stock exchange uh, and to investors, but what if users of Twitter and participants actually became um, 
owners of Twitter shares. Uh, similarly, Facebook, other kinds of things where people who are users and participants also become owners of these kinds of enterprises. And you know, it's interesting to think about museums because museums are community assets in many ways. And what does it look like for a museum to exit to community or return to community? Or maybe many museums are already uh, exited to communities, but it's an interesting way of thinking about giving communities greater access to ownership and governance of, of these kinds of enterprises and these kinds of projects. The other signal that I like is uh, Community Arts Stabilization Trust. Uh, uh, many communities have those, or maybe some communities have them. Uh, and basically it allows um, artists and art organizations to acquire spaces, physical spaces, either rent them for um, under market prices or buy them giving people access to that essential resource. The reason I like these particular signals is because they give communities and people access to these very valuable assets. A couple of years ago at the Institute, we published what we call uh, a manifesto of universal basic assets. Remember that conversation about wealth and how important it is and that wealth is your assets minus debt and assets primarily are financial assets and homes, but there are other kinds of assets that you can have that are important, like data is an asset, know-how, communities, places, spaces, uh, all of these kinds of things. Nature is an asset, art is an asset. So in both of those cases, it what these ventures are doing or these projects is allowing more people to get access to these valuable assets. So what I would like to do, uh, take another five minutes and ask you, you're in the world, you're seeing lots of things, you're seeing signals. So take five minutes and use the same chat function and share what are the signals that you're seeing? What are the signals particularly that give you hope for the future? Okay, the last piece of the puzzle is writing future stories. A colleague of mine often says that there are no facts about the future, only fiction. And if you think about it, it's really true that everything we know, all the facts and data comes to us from history, but there are no facts about the future, which is a really great thing because it means that the future is not preordained. The future is something you have agency in, you can create a better future you can create, you have a lot of agency in building the kind of future you want to, to live in. So it's a really important part of the puzzle because really, unless you can imagine it, you won't be able to build it. So the future does begin in your imagination. And right now we're living in the world where there are very few optimistic, hopeful, future visions and future stories. This is actually an op-ed piece from the New York Times written before the pandemic where Michelle Goldberg, who is a writer, she talks about how there are no positive visions of the future. Every vision of the future, whether it's science fiction or it's polls of people, um, they're so negative, they're so dystopian. You know, suicide rates are high, you know, the climate change, all these very, negative stories, even the stories about technologies where 30, 40 years ago, we were so optimistic about these technologies and how we will all be connected and it will bring greater democracy are turning out to be sort of dystopian as we're seeing computational propaganda and, and so many kind of stories and different narratives uh, and, and the kind of fighting and wars of different narratives. So we're lacking these positive stories. And I think this is really important right now because right now we're in a pretty dark place. Uh, there are a lot of things that are coming at us, but it's more than ever important for us to start writing. What is it we, that we want the future to look like? What are those positive stories that we can create? How do we reframe that? And who are better at doing that than artists? Because 
you know, artists, I always say and write about this, that artists are futurists because they shine the light on things we may not recognize. They see things that others may not see. They ask questions, pointed questions. They provoke us. They imagine things that may, we may say it's not possible, but ultimately they are the ones who should be leading us in writing these future stories and these positive stories and igniting our imaginations. Um, I like this particular group. It's called uh, US Department of Arts and Culture. It was created a couple of years ago. It's a networked organization that brings activists from all over the country. One of the things they're doing is once a year, they do people's state of the union addresses, self-organized from bottom up in different locations where people share their state of the union. So through poetry, through music, through expression of every kind, Ultimately, what they're doing is um, they're engaging people in the process of civic imagination, imagining things and voicing things and creating narratives that are from bottom up and where everybody is engaged in the process of shaping and imagining these futures. And I think it's really important to be doing that right now. We're in real bad need of these positive stories. And as we're doing this, we're imagining these things. These are some of the things that I would like us to consider. I would like us to think about it. What can we imagine? What would it take for us to recognize arts and creative work as essential work? We're now talking a lot about essential work. We're talking about frontline workers, health workers, and others. But if you look around you and what people are doing and how they're coping with this moment, they're all engaged in some creative projects, whether it's cooking or it's knitting or it's writing poetry or it's doing all these different things. This is like really their means for survival. So it is essential to our survival to engage in this kind of creative work. So why not recognize it? What would it look like for us to recognize arts and creative work as essential work? What does it mean in terms of policies that we put into place? Um, what would it look for us to think of arts as an essential asset? There's so much research showing that connection with the art uh, is so important to people's health. This um, research from uh, England, for example, showed that people who go to museums, they tend to live longer, which is not surprising because we know that the sense of awe, the kind of sense we experience where it, we're faced with something that grander than we are, like the Grand Canyon or great pieces of art, it, it really makes us feel much more hopeful, much more optimistic. And so it's not surprising that it has direct impact to our health. How about we recognize that access to art is an essential asset, just like access to clean water or clean air or health or education or other kinds of things, what would that look like? What would those policies look like that would recognize that? And finally, this is something I've written about in uh, for a Philadelphia Museum of Art for the exhibit designs for different futures, asking a question, how can we see a new kind of and create a new kind of solidarity between gig workers and precarious workers and artists. In many ways, artists are the original precarious workers, original gig workers. But what would it look like to really seize a solidarity and create these kinds of connections? What kind of power can we get from recognizing that, that it's not just about artists, it's not about Uber drivers, but there is actually solidarity there. What kind of power can we gain from that? And in imagining all of this, um, and this is my plea to you, I feel like museums can play and should play an important role in that. In fact, museums can become and should become platforms for imagining and creating better futures. This is very much needed and something that museums can play an essential role in. Thank you very much.
Hello, I am Kay Wynn Feldman, the director of the National Gallery of Art, and we are located in Washington, D.C. That is not a Zoom background behind me. I'm delighted to talk to you today, and I want to start by thanking Laura Lott and the entire team at the American Alliance of Museums for their leadership during this difficult time for all of us. I also want to thank all of you, our um, great folks across the nation who are working at American Museums to um, serve the nation um, with all of the great content and work that you are all doing. Today, I wanted to stress the three themes that I'm stressing with our staff here at the National Gallery. We're talking about connection, curiosity, and courage. Connection is the great importance for us all to stay connected to our colleagues, our family, our friends, our loved ones during this time. We all know that human connection is so important to us and we have to take advantage of the tools that we have through the telephone, through um, virtual meetings, um, virtual contacts to stay connected to other people. It's of such great importance right now. And um, I have spent my whole life moving around. My father was in the Coast Guard. And so I am taking great joy in staying connected to the people who have been important to me throughout my life and all of my life moves. I also am inspired by curiosity. Probably like you, I've spent some time um, thinking about our predecessors who have suffered through the Justinian plague in the sixth century, the um, great plague, of uh, the uh, 16th century, the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century, and of course, the Spanish flu of the last century. And I think about um, the ways that people suffered uh, and didn't have any ways to stay stimulated through the great um, domination of books, of the internet, of podcasts, all of the ways today that we can explore the world and remain curious. I've had great joy in being able to explore 18th century India, 15th century England, and 16th century Mexico. So I urge you all to um, stay curious and continue exploring our world through all of the means that you have available to you. And then finally, I wanna to touch on courage. And I'm sure like you, I am inspired by the courage of all of our frontline responders, everybody in hospitals across um, the nation, across the globe, all of the people who are um, going to work every day in supermarkets, um, delivery, all of these important people in our lives. And of course, the people in museums who are coming in every day and protecting our collections and our buildings um, our registrars who are working so hard. And I take great um, joy in celebrating the courage of all of those workers. So I'm gonna finish by urging all of you to remain brave and courageous during this time. And please remember, stay connected, be curious, and be courageous. Thank you.